So I think uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Respected uh, participants, our guest speaker for today. Uh, I think we can start the program on time so that we can finish on time, inshallah. Uh, we have a good number to start with. Uh, let me invite uh, Madam Abdullahi Lamido to give us opening recitation of the Quran and also prayer. Madam Abdullahi, let us begin. Mashkura. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya nisa an-nabiyyi lastunna ka ahadin min an-nisa In ittaqaytunna fala takhda'na bil qawli fayatma'a alladhi fi qalbihi maradun wa qulna qawlan ma'rufa وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ وَلَا تَبَرَّجِنَ تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ الْأُولَى وَأَقِمْنَ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتِينَ الزَّكَاةَ وَأَطِعْنَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجِسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا وذكرنا ما يتلى في بيوتكن من آيات الله والحكمة إن الله كان لطيفا خبيرا إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم الخيرة من أمرهم ومن يعص الله ورسوله فقد ضل ضلالا مبينا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد وعلى آل محمد وعلى آل محمد وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك عزيز مجيد سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسكون وسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله ما شاء الله جزاكم الله خير يا دكتور حمال عبد الله أبو بكر لاميتو وذي ميلديوس رساتشن of the Holy Quran particularly the verses Malam has recited they are very much relevant to our topic of the day uh, at this juncture, let me uh, welcome all our participants to this important webinar, which is the fifth in the series of the Sokota Caliphate that uh, the Islamic Forum of Nigeria is organizing. And this time around, alhamdulillah, we have a very uh, carefully uh, well-chosen topic to be discussed by our able speaker, our able guest lecturer, that Muhammad Jamil Yushab. Uh, before I continue, <clears throat> uh, let me introduce our speaker for today. Uh, well, uh, looking at the, the CV, the long CV of our Abel speaker, uh, indeed, I can only summarize because it's very rich and inshallah it tells us a lot about uh, the type of personality today we have uh, capable of handling 
this important topic. I think the Islamic Forum of Nigeria, the, 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 the such light this time around is, is very powerful to identify the speaker uh, of this uh, personality. Our speaker for today is Dr. Muhammad Jamil Yusha'u, <coughs> PhD, uh, and also uh, an international development expert, author and public relations practitioner. His work, uh, he works in three different continents in Africa, Europe, and Middle East. He was twice the president of the United Kingdom uh, based charity organization in the UK from 2005 to 2010 and 2011 to 2012. He has uh, work experience uh, uh, being a senior lecturer uh, in media and politics at Northumbria uh, University, Newcastle. And also he was a former uh, producer at the BBC World Service in London. Dr. Jamil uh, has his um, BA in mass communication from Bayer University, Kano, uh, and MA in political communications and PhD in journalism studies from the University of Sheffield. Uh, in 2015, he completed a Master of Business, uh, the Master of Business Admin from IE Business School in Madrid, Spain. Uh, Dr. Yushaku also uh, was uh, a British Chevron scholar an alumni of the executive education program and in innovation and entrepreneurship uh, policy consideration. Uh, he has uh, additional uh, uh, photo of regional uh, parallelism. He is an author of the regional parallelism corruption scandals in Nigeria, which uh, I think part of his PhD work that he produced. His research has been published in leading academic journals like global media and communication uh, and other international uh, uh, journals. Uh, today, we have Dr. Jamil, who is also a member of Chartered Institute of Public Relations, London. He has vast experience. This is just to summarize uh, what he has to his credit for our, for those of us who do not know Dr. Jamil. And inshallah, from the lecture that he's going to present, we are going to know more about himself and also his area of interest. Now, the topic of uh, today that is going to discuss, presented by Dr. Jamil, is the Nana Asma tradition, lessons for, success, for successful Muslim women, socio-political activism, and parenting in the 21st century. Like I mentioned, this is a well-chosen topic. It's a topic that will, you know, will need to be applied uh, the lessons from it uh, to be learned for the parenting in the 21st century, especially from the caliber woman, a uh, person of uh, Nana Asma'u. Uh, may Allah be, 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 uh, bless her. Now, at this juncture, let me invite Dr. Jamilu to uh, start his presentation, inshallah. We have about uh, 40 minutes to, for the talk to, uh, inshallah, present his work. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أفضل الخلق خاتم الأنبياء وإمام المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد brothers and sisters from every part of the world that have joined this seminar I would like to open this by greeting you with the best of salutations the salutation of the people of paradise Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh um, Before I delve into the presentation inshallah let me first of all start by thanking uh, the Islamic Forum of Nigeria for inviting me to present this talk I am immensely grateful to our teacher and a role model, a mentor. When we were, you know, in the university, he is one of the people who look up to, uh, Professor Salish Shehu, who invited us to come and make uh, share a little about this area. Uh, this is an area of keen interest to me personally, and I have written about it before. And um, gladly, even at the time, uh, Professor Salish Shehu's contribution to that presentation about 17 years ago was very important. So I'm very grateful to him for reviving my interest personally in this area of discussion. I am also uh, grateful to all the participants who have joined. I can see my teachers 
and even some of the personalities who have really contributed by assisting me with some of the materials that I use in uh, making this presentation. So it is quite an honor and I do hope inshallah this presentation will be beneficial to me and to all those who are listening today, especially in this age at this time when I believe the role of women, Muslim women, successful Muslim women is very critical to the success of the Muslim Ummah wherever we are in the part of the world. Um, and I think the um, person who was chosen to be the central figure or the central, the center of this discussion, Nana Asma Fodio, is very apt even in light of the global climate of what's happening today around the world. Let me start with a little disclaimer that uh, this presentation, whatever I say here is my personal opinion and does not in any way reflect the position of any of the institutions that I'm affiliated with presently or in the past. I have uh, divided the presentation into several sections. Uh, following the introduction, I would discuss who is Nana Asma'u. Um, I will discuss also the Entaru movement, which was one of the major contributions that she made. Um, and then I will go on, because one of the things that I would like to argue in this presentation is that the Nana Asma'u tradition that we are talking about today is beyond Nana Asma as a person, is beyond the personality. It is actually a tradition, an Islamic tradition, which showcases women as central part of the development of the Ummah, particularly in almost every area you can think of. And therefore what she did was to carry that flag, continue to use it, and therefore I would like to share the stories of some successful Muslim women scholars and activists uh, who have contributed uh, in shaping the um, development of the Islamic society as a, civiliz a civilization, as a hub of intellectual uh, development. And I would like to cite specific example about the story of these women where they compare with Nana Asma'u and at the same time, how the role of parenting played a crucial role um, in, the, um, in the development of these uh, women in different uh, uh, facets of life. We will hear about women who were scholars, who were teaching men, we will hear about women who were actually teaching their husbands. We will hear about scholars actually who were, uh, who were learning from their wives and a number of, uh, of examples like that. And then at the end of the lecture, inshallah, I'm going to discuss about 10 lessons that would be drawn from the experiences and the stories that I'm going to share today, which are very relevant and important for every parent, especially in this century, where there are a lot of distractions that could take away the attention of parents from their responsibility. And then I will conclude with some recommendations. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us as we go through the uh, presentation. Now, as you are aware, the Sokoto Caliphate is an amazing um, empire that was established in the 19th century. And it was able to mobilize different ethnic nationalities. And Alhamdulillah, the the historical aspect and the political territory of the caliphate is still very much in existence, despite this disruption that was caused uh, by, um, by colonialism. And um, major studies have been carried out about the uh, caliphate, uh, which are available. You will find them in Arabic language, you will find them in Hausa language, you will even find them in Fulfulde language. Um, and for those who are interested in this kind of studies in, um, uh, in English language, I think there are many of them, but I think there are two that, that um, uh, you know, the, that, that stand out. And I would like to recommend people to look for these studies. I am quite impressed by the work of Malay Ibrahim, Dr. Ibrahim Suleiman, uh, Revolution in History. And also another very classical work, which was done by Dr. Usman Bugaje, uh, his PhD thesis. And I do hope that Dr. Bugaje has published that, uh, that dissertation, because it really showcases where the Sokoto Caliphate was different from other, you know, uh, religious and revivalist movements that happened in Africa and in other parts of the world. Now, as you are aware, the Sokoto Caliphate was formed in 1804. And therefore, we are now in the beginning of the third century of the formation of the Caliphate. And one of the key teachings and um, focus of Sheikh Uthman ibn Fodio was the education of women, because he came at a time when the education of women was at the background. Some of the scholars and the clergy were even against it. Um, so women were living in a very state of ignorance, which as we shall hear uh, in this lecture, is actually against the philosophy in which Islam was founded as a religion. If you look at the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will see that his life entirely was surrounded by very powerful and successful women, right from his wife Khadija, 
who was a source of inspiration and support for him and to his other wives, Aisha radiallahu anha, Hafsa, Umm Salma, who even after his life became some of the leading scholars and jurists of the Ummah. So that was what uh, Sheikh Uthman ibn Fodio tried to uh, revive and bring back to the, uh, to the, you know, to, to the Ummah. Now, Nana Asma'u, as we hear, she is the daughter of Sheikh Uthman ibn Fodio, and she was named after the daughter of the first caliph in Islam, Abu Bakr ibn Siddiq, Abu Bakr Siddiq. Now, she was also a twin. And what I found quite interesting is that Nana Asma was not the first Muslim woman scholar that we had in West Africa. There were other women scholars, some uh, like Umm Hani of the Torankawa, Khadijat al-Kubra, the daughter of uh, Sheikh Uthman ibn Khodio himself. There is uh, Sheikha Rabi'at bint Muddibo from Yola, who is an expert in the uh, Quranic studies in Nijin Girdi. Uh, Aisha Nakabara. And in, even in, um, in colonial and post-colonial Nigeria, we had very powerful Muslim women like uh, Al-Hajja Humani Alaga, who came from a very powerful Muslim uh, family uh, in southwestern part of Nigeria and played an important role in ensuring that Muslim community had enough schools and she fought for their rights uh, at a very difficult time. But Nana Asma, who despite this, you can say she has become the, she has become the prominent symbol of women education and exemplary life uh, from uh, West Africa. Therefore, the central thesis in this discussion is that Nana Asma'u tradition is actually an Islamic tradition that sees the Muslim woman as an embodiment of scholarship and social change. And this is very important, especially if we are going to look at the challenges that we are facing today and if we want to genuinely and sincerely address them. I therefore would like to offer or propose a definition of what is Nana Asma'u tradition, which is the central theme of this paper. Here, Nana Asma'u tradition is defined as the domestication of the Islamic tradition that affirms the position of a Muslim woman as a central figure in the intellectual, spiritual, and parental development of the society. I'm saying this because this is a way of challenging and bringing to question the media perception and the promotion, especially by Orientalist scholars that try to showcase the Muslim woman as backward, as somebody who is not fit for purpose. No, this is far from the case. And as we shall see, we will like, I will bring um, a very powerful argument about successful Muslim women scholars that the Muslim world can challenge any society basically to produce new women of similar kalima like them. Asma bint Fodio bint Muhammad bin Saleh, also known as Nana Wargari, she was among the daughters of Uthman ibn Fodio, and she was born in the year for two, 1208 Hijri, which was equivalent to around 1792 uh, in the Gregorian calendar. And she was born in the Gale uh, from her mother, Maimuna, who was one of the wives of Sheikh Uthman ibn Fodio. Her husband is called uh, Gidado, who was a student of Sheikh Uthman ibn Fodio and has had participated actively in the entire reform and the jihad movement. He was a confidant of her brother, Muhammad Bello, and he was appointed to be the Grand Vizier, which you can say is like the prime minister of the Caliphate at the time. That was her husband. She, is a poet. she was a poet, a scholar, a community organizer. Not only that, she was empowered with a very powerful tool, which was one of the reasons why her work was quite successful, meaning she was a speaker in several languages. She speaks Arabic, she speaks Hausa, Fulfulde, and um, Tamashek language. Her contribution is amazing. There are several works that have compiled her, her works. And uh, SubhanAllah, just like uh, you know somebody as a very good daughter, the daughter of a good parent, she, some of the early works she started with was the translation of the work of her father, Sheikh Uthman ibn Fodio, such as Tabban Hakika. And um, she has written a number of books as well, such as Tanbih al Ghafilin wa Tadkir al Aqilin, Ila uh, which was a, a very good that is calling for obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She has also published a number of work which involve poetry, um, which involve commentary of the Quran. She is a memorizer of the Quran. Actually, she memorized the Quran at the age of 10. Uh, she gave birth to some of her children, including Abdullahi Bayero. Uh, and then from 1834 to 1839, she wrote several of her works, such as A Warning, Forgive Me, uh, uh, which gave birth, uh, you know, to a number of work that followed uh, that. 
Some of her work also, she was very good in writing elegies, and she has written a number of them, such as Elegy for My Sister Fatima. Um, she also wrote the story of Shehu, Remembrance of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, The Path to the Truth, and Elegy for Gidatu, her husband, uh, actually, especially after he died in the year 1874. One of the engagements of Asma bint Fodiyu was her translation uh, of uh, the Quran, uh, and at the same time also using that as a way of teaching for the uh, teaching the students who were uh, trooping actually to come and uh, listen to uh, to some of her work. So their work, her work is uh, quite amazing and there is a lot of it. I think due to time factor, I will skip uh, some of it and move into the uh, next uh, session. Uh, she lived to be around um, 72 years old. She died when she died and um, she was uh, uh, buried just like uh, the other members of the Sokoto Caliphate in the Khubari of Sheikh Uthman Ibn Fodio. Now, um, one of the classical contributions that Nana Asma Ibn Fodio made was the establishment of the Entaru movement. This movement actually was one of the things that distinguished her. The Entaru movement, which is referring to the associates, brings together a caliber of women, especially in the neighborhood, who come to take knowledge from her. Now, over time, Asma Ibn Fodio, she realized that uh, actually the classes were growing bigger and bigger. And therefore, it was becoming like an academy and a college. And so she decided to come up with a very innovative approach of spreading the message of Islam. And as a result of that, um, she created the entire movement where she appointed women, uh, you know, as the leaders, especially the elderly women. She will appoint them. And for each group, she will identify a woman and um, appoint her to serve as the leader. And that leader, she assigned her as, uh, as a judge. Now, that judge, she normally gives her a malafa with some stripe of, uh, on it, uh, red in color, to show a sign of authority. Now, this movement was a very good thing because what she did, actually, this is a very clever move. One of the challenges the society was facing at the time was the issue of divination, so saying, magic, and other things like that. A smart bit for you instead decided, actually, to turn this into a positive. So she changed the Bori system, actually, and Islamize it, if uh, I were to use the, that term, and then give the people an alternative. So before you take away something from people, try and give them something that will serve as an, uh, uh, an alternative. She was a very observant leader of the community. She, you know, um, uh, you know um, focuses and observed how Sheikh Uthman Ibn Fodio was conducting his uh, activities, and therefore she has really mastered that, the art of that, and you could see that even in some of uh, the work that she has written, such as Waq al Giwe and Filtago. And she has acti actively participated as well in the jihad movement. She was serving as a nurse and a caregiver during the, the time. Now, it will be interesting to let you know that I think globally today, one of the things that make Asma bin Tifodio quite a unique person is the entire movement. Because it's a movement that has a clear structure, it has a clear leadership and the followers know their role. Not only that, she was using that actually by producing songs and poetry, teaching people, making it easy for them to memorize, especially, you know, she comes from a society that is very oral in nature. It wasn't easy for everybody to read and write. And as a result of that, she translated that into, um, into songs. And then she will teach this woman, the judges, then they will go and teach other women, then other women will teach other women. And I'm sure many of us here must have witnessed at a point in time, especially in northern part of Nigeria, where these elderly women come to houses, sometimes trying to teach, uh, to teach women how to perform ablution and other things like that. It's interesting to note that today, and especially among Muslim, uh, uh, black Muslim sisters, they have adopted this strategy of entire movement and they are using it actually in the 21st century as a way of providing quality education and knowledge of Islam to other people. Um, in the United States, for instance, a group of women came together and established what they call the Entaru Education Foundation and Charitable Trust. And actually, they have established a dedicated website, which is now live. You can go and visit the, the website. It's called entaru.com. And this uh, foundation now has several chapters, actually, in different parts of the United States, especially in Pennsylvania, Texas, Alabama, Georgia, California, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Los Angeles, Oakland, Florida, and Massachusetts. 
And what's um, quite interesting about these women, actually, if you go to their website, you will see that they have a library, they have a lot of um, activities. And they are even appointing judges among themselves. One of such judges is now, she's called Dalia bint uh, Hamadi Kamara, who now moves around the world trying to teach people and provide them uh, Islamic education. And one of the things she does actually is even to do teaching um, using uh, video uh, formats. In this year, in 2020, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is uh, also gaining momentum after the, especially the uh, assassination or the killing of George Floyd by the US police, another group uh, called the Black Muslims Forum has established what they call the Entaru Institute because they were trying to find an inspiration, uh, actually, especially among Black Muslims as a way of showcasing that, look, yeah, even Black Muslims uh, have made a contribution and they were using it as a way of also addressing racism, especially in areas where there is racism uh, in the Muslim community, which does exist, uh, you know, in, uh, in some past, uh, part of the world. So in this institute, they are coming up with several courses that is trying to um, showcase the contribution of Black Muslims uh, uh, globally. They are doing courses in like the history of Michael Malcolm X, African tribes, you know, the African empires, religion, and uh, many other things uh, like that. Now, when you look at the history and life of Asma Bintifodio, you can say that Asma Bintifodio, what she did was a norm, was the norm, actually. And on the other hand, when you look at it critically, you can see that it is the exception. Now, what do I mean by this? You know, Muslim women from the beginning of Islam were at the forefront in terms of intellectual contribution. In many instances, they were politically active. And therefore, from this perspective, you can say that, you know, the, the case of Nana Asma'u was, you know, was part of the norm. But where it was the exception as well is that what she did was this idea of domestication and coming up with a very interesting movement, especially the entire movement, which... Uh, whose impact is still seen uh, in the society today. And you can see that even other places, other parts of the world in one way or another are trying to adopt it and use the method uh, in teaching other uh, you know, Muslim uh, women. It's also very interesting that she is a very skilled woman. What we know most about is her intellectual and uh, scholarly contribution. But also Nana Asma was also a diplomat. One of the interesting things uh, actually that happened, uh, you know, was when uh, Muhammad Al-Amin al kanami of Brno wrote a letter, a very strong letter to the Sokoto Caliphate, which, uh, which even resulted in the fear that did could, could result in a war. And um, Muhammad Bello, uh, uh, who was the Khalifa at the time, asked Asma bin Tifodio actually to draft the letter that will serve as a reply to, uh, you know, to the Brno Empire, which ended up settling the matter and the al kanami also changing uh, his mind. It was also reported that actually when the um, uh, British um, uh, a, a visitor, Cla Hugh Clapperton, visited um, uh, Nigeria and he came to Sokoto, her and her, her husband Gidato were among the ones who hosted him and discussed some of the trade agreements and other things like that. So she is quite unique in several fronts. And um, you could see that in some of her writings and some of the compilations of her work uh, that are now available in different uh, languages. Now. As I said at the beginning, Islam has been blessed with unique Muslim, Muslim, Muslim scholars, activists, reformers who have contributed in shaping the Islamic tradition. But what is interesting is that the work of this woman has not received uh, due attention, especially in the English language rich literature. And therefore, because uh, especially today where the internet is largely controlled by the English language, when you read some of the work of Asma bin Tifodio, you might think that she is an exception within the Islamic tradition. And this is one of the things that I wanted to draw attention to, that as much as we celebrate Asma bin Tifodio, as, long, as much as we love her, and as, was, uh, as much as we want to project her life, we have to understand also that what she did is to continue a tradition that was in existence. Because if you go through history, you will find amazing work uh, by Muslim women, especially from the beginning to the fifth and even up to the eighth uh, century. These are doc documented in many classical books of Islam, such as Sira Alam al Nubala, Tariq Baghdad, and Alam al Nisa. And I'm going to, inshallah, showcase uh, some of these, uh, you know, uh, some of these women. In, in fact, some of the classic scholars of Islam, uh, such as Ibn Hajar al Asqalani, it was reported that he has at, at, at least around 400 women teachers from whom he has taken knowledge. Um, one of the imagined scholars who is working in this area of uh, the contribution of uh, 
women scholars uh, in Islam, uh, Muhammad Akram Nadwi, uh, the founder of As Salam Institute. He has recently completed a book. The book is called Al Muhaddithat. Now, it's an encyclopedia, almost 40 volumes in Arabic. And in this book, he has compiled all the, the information of over 8,000 women who were established scholars in the field of hadith alone. The book has not yet been published, but the uh, preface is now available. When you read this book, you will be amazed by the type of nana asma'us that have been produced in the, um, in the history uh, uh, of Islam. And I would like to give example, just uh, before we go into the, uh, into the other aspects of the lecture, uh, with some of these women that have really made significant contribution and uh, their stories also are quite amazing and interesting. And one of these women actually is the daughter of uh, Saeed Ibn al Musayyib, a famous, you know, uh, juggernaut, intellectual juggernaut, you know, and one of the tabi'in who was teaching in the, uh, uh, in the, in the mosque of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you can say that, uh, you know, uh, some of the, uh, the scholars actually describe him as the Malikul Fuqaha. And some call him the Faqihul Fuqaha because of the amount of knowledge. Even, you know, some of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they have strong respect for, uh, for Sa'id Ibn al-Musayyib. Now, Sa'id Ibn al-Musayyib, he has a daughter. And he, as, as you know, he's actually also, which is a very interesting lesson that, uh, that, that we, sh we should learn too, especially for people who are, uh, who are parents or who would be parents, that whoever wants to have a successful family, one of the things that he needs to do is to make sure that right from the selection of the wife, he has made the right choice. And in the case of Saeed ibn al-Musayyib, he, he was actually married to the daughter of Abu Huraira, one the companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you know, uh, Umm Habib. And through that marriage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with a daughter. Now, this daughter was a classical scholar. And one day, Saeed ibn al-Musayyib, he has a student uh, whom he noticed that was not coming to the uh, classes um, for about three days. This student, Abdullah ibn Adi Wada, came to the uh, lesson of uh, Saeed ibn al-Musayyib. And then he looked at him and he said, what happened to you? You have not been attending our lesson for quite uh, a number of days. What's wrong with you? And then he looked at him. And he said, yes, I'm not coming to the lesson because I lost my wife. Uh, and therefore, I was praying in the masjid near to my house so that, you know, when people come to visit me, you know, and make condolence visit, I would be able, uh, able to, uh, to address them. So Saeed ibn al-Musayyib looked at him and he said, okay, uh, have you started conversation or discussion with another woman? And then, you know, this uh, student of uh, Saeed ibn al-Musayyib looked at him and he said, uh, you know, Ya Abba Saeed, man yuzawijuni wa ma indi illa darhaman aw thalatha. Who is going to marry me? Who will give me his daughter? Who is there to accept a student who is a faqir like me when I don't have anything except two dirhams or, uh, or, or, or even three? Then Saeed ibn al-Musayyib looked at him and he said, Anna, I'm the one who will give you that. And then right there, he, you know, uh, conducted the marriage between these students of his and his daughter. So this student finished the lesson. He went back home uh, and it was time for prayer. Uh, you know, it, it was Maghrib time and it was time for Iftar. He has, he has, uh, you know, he was trying to break his fast and he had a knock on his door. And when he had the knock on his door, uh, he said, who is it? And a voice said, it is Saeed. And he said, Saeed? Which Saeed? Because in his mind, he could not imagine that it was Saeed uh, ibn al-Musayyib. Because by tradition, they know that Saeed ibn al-Musayyib, they know that for about 40 years, the only place that he was seen was between mosque and the masjid. They don't see him moving around in the city. You know, teaching and family. That is what he is dedicated to. And then he told him it is Saeed. And then he opened the door. And right there, it was Saeed ibn al-Musayyib. And then he looked at him uh, and he said, you have just been married. And I felt that it's not right for you to spend the night without your wife and here is your wife. And he came with this daughter of his. And then, you know, he left him, knocked the door, locked the door and, and he left. Now, this daughter of Saeed ibn al-Musayyib, who was married to this, uh, this student, 
you know, stayed with him. And then a few days later, her husband wanted to go for the lesson that her father was providing. And then she saw him trying to take his clothes and wear. And then um, she asked him, what are you doing? Where are you going? He said, I'm going to the assembly of Sa'id to listen to his lectures and knowledge. And then this daughter of Sa'id ibn Musayib said, calm down. Please uh, t- take back your cloth, put everything, sit down here, and I will teach you the knowledge of Sa'id. And he sat down and she started teaching him. He spent 40 days without going to the halqa of her father. And one day when he went to the halqa of her father, her father looked at him, where have you been? And he said, uh, Alhamdulillah. He said, how did you find that person? And he said, she is the one of the best scholars I have ever met in my life. And I have never seen a woman who is, you know, who knows the right of husband like this, uh, like this, uh, like this woman. So this is to show you that what Nana Asma'u did was actually carrying the legacy of this woman who, her, who were amazing uh, scholars. There is also the story of uh, Fatima, daughter of Imam Malik, Ibn Anas, who is also very proficient in the Muatta Malik. Because Imam Malik, as a father, he did not dedicate his time to teaching the children of others alone. He never forgot his family. He would always dedicate time and he will create this time to teach to the extent that it was reported that this daughter of Imam Malik, she would on occasions listen. She has memorized the Muatta, by the way, by heart. She will listen to students reading the Muatta of her father and she will be stopping and correcting them from the mistakes that they were, uh, they were making. And this was the Islamic tradition that you would find the rest of the scholars. al qadi Iyab, a famous Maliki scholar, especially for those of us who are in West Africa who follow the Maliki Madhab, he dedicates enough time every day after the Asr prayer to go and uh, teach, um, you know, uh, his daughters, uh, you know, so that they can also be, become proficient in Islamic knowledge. One of the interesting and amazing stories also that, uh, you know, will, will, will teach you and show you that the Nana Asma'u tradition we are talking about has been an Islamic tradition is the story of the daughter of Alauddin as samraqandi Her name is Fatima as samraqandi Now, Alauddin as samraqandi was one of the famous uh, scholars of the, fiqh, uh, of the Hanafi uh, school of thought. Now, he has written a book called Tuhfatul Fuqaha, which is a, a very interesting compendium, uh, particularly from the perspective of the Hanafi fiqh. Now, one of the things that uh, Assam Rakhandi did was to make sure that his daughter was proficient and has developed enough expertise in this, uh, uh, in this book. Not only that, this daughter of Assam Rakhandi, she is known to be very beautiful. So she was the talk of the town. So many noble people were coming trying to, uh, you know, to marry her. And Assam Rakhandi declined most of the offers from these noble people who were trying to marry his daughter. Instead, he decided to advise that she marries one of his students. And that student is al Kasani, who is another scholar. Now, what is interesting about this story is that al Kasani has taken the book Tuhfatul Fuqaha and has written a commentary on it. And the commentary of the book is called Bada'i Sana'i Fi Tartibi Shara'i. It's a very interesting compendium. And I can tell you today, the book, if you take it, in current you know, publication, is about 10 volumes. Each volume is about 500 to 600 words. So when the marriage was about to be consummated, there was nothing he could offer that he think was of value to marry the daughter of this scholar. Then he decided to offer Bada'i wa Sana'i fi tartibi shara'i as the dowry of this uh, uh, for his marriage. And the daughter accepted and her father as Gandhi accepted this uh, gift and you know it became the dowry and therefore he became her husband. Now, what is the interesting story? When uh, al Kasani, you know, married her, he realized that she was one of the best scholars that you could find in the society. And he himself, the, look at the amount of work that he has done, but he had to be referring to her as a reference point when it comes to, uh, to, to, to matters of fatwa. She will be correcting him and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and supporting him and giving him advice. So this was the level of knowledge. There is also another Muslim scholar. Her name is Karima, was Karima al marwaziyya who is another, you know, Nana Asma'u that the Muslim world has produced. You know, this uh, woman, she was a scholar of hadith. And her father, listen to this, parents, 
took her and traveled with her to almost every part of the world in search of Islamic knowledge. He took her to places like Mecca, like Isfahan, like, uh, you know, Beit al-Maqdis in search of knowledge. And later they came and settled in Mecca. This woman, Karima al marwaziya she became a scholar and was teaching in Mecca, near the Haram, and sometimes even inside the Haram, to the extent that when people come for Hajj, they go and take knowledge from her. And she lived to be around 100 years old. And interestingly, all she did in her life was to dedicate her life to Islamic knowledge, and she even never had the time to even get marriage. So, uh, you know, to, to be married. And you know, now in, in most recent history also, you can find women like um, uh, Fatima Al-Fihri. You know, this is an amazing woman. And I can tell you, and I believe many, most of the people, or many of the people who are listening to this presentation today, have passed through a university system or have the intention to, to pass through a university system. Now, this woman, Fatima Al-Fihri, she was the founder of the first ever university established in the world. So today, wherever you are in the world, if you have a university degree or a diploma, you are benefiting from the legacy of Fatima Al-Fihri, who, after inheriting wealth from, my, from her father, decided to establish a grand mosque, you know, and then uh, which later translated into a university. And it, was, it, it is called Al-Qirawan University. And that university still exists in Morocco. It has even been declared, declared as a kind of, um, uh, you know, UNESCO World uh, Heritage Site. It has some of the oldest classic books that you can find, over 4,000 collections at the time. Even some of the works of uh, the likes of Ibn Khaldun were there. So these are all very good examples to show that the Nana Asma'u tradition, which showcases the, the Muslim woman as a scholar, has been in existence within the Islamic tradition. And there are other amazing and interesting stories, uh, you know, uh, maybe I will uh, mention a few of them and then go into the lessons uh, because I can see the time uh, is approaching. Among these women, for instance, you can find people, or you can find mothers, very strong mothers, who, whose parenting skills contributed greatly in producing some of the leading scholars that we have today in the Ummah. And, uh, you know, you can talk of, uh, for instance, the mother of Imam Malik ibn Anas. You know, you know she, 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 she really, uh, you know, looked at him, she studied him, she saw that this is an amazing young boy whose entire life is dedicated to the seeking of knowledge. And therefore, one day, you know, uh, she, Imam Malik came to her and said, I want to start attending the halqa and the lessons of Rabi'at al-Rai. And, you know, Rabi'at al-Rai, he's, he's, an, you know, he's, uh, he's really a juggernaut, you know. He has produced many students of the ummah. And she, was, she said, you want? Yes. And then she sent a message to Rabi'ah that Malik is going to be taking, uh, you know, knowledge, uh, you know, uh, from you. And he accepted. And she started, uh, and Imam Malik uh, prepared to go. Now, when he was about to start going, his mother prepared him and gave him the best of dresses that he could wear. In fact, in some of the narrations, he was saying that, Kanat ummi tu animuni. My, my, my mother used to dress me and put the amama for me as a young child. Imam Malik was even asking her, you know, you know, mother, halil yawm eid? And his mother would look at him to say, and, and, and tell him that, yes, eidul lak. It is an aid for you. So she will dress him beautifully, you know? And then the mother will advise him before he goes to start seeking for knowledge and tell him that, you know, idhab ila rabi'ah. Go to rabi'ah to take knowledge. Lakin wa'lam min adabihi qabla ilmi. Try and learn from his knowledge, uh, from, his, uh, from his manners before you even learn from his, uh, no, uh, before you even take his knowledge. And at the end of the day, if you look, read the, his, the, the, the tarjama and the biography of Imam Malik, you realize that he's a very neat person, always well-dressed from the quality that he has imbibed, you know, by the teaching of his uh, mother. Imam al-Bukhari is the same, his mother, actually. And, and, and this is a very interesting story as well, which, is a, which contains a very good lesson for parents, uh, um, you know, of today. Um, which is that when Imam al-Bukhari was born, he was born blind, you know, according to the biography that uh, Ibn Rajab, uh, Ibn Hajar has written about him, you know. And the mother was praying every day, day and night, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns the sight of Imam al-Bukhari. And at the end of the day, one day she had a dream with Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam telling her that, you know, the sight of your son has been restored. And, you know, overnight, she realized that, uh, you know, when she woke up, Allah has returned the sight of Imam al-Bukhari. And as a result of that, she dedicated her life to providing him with knowledge to the extent that at the age of 16, 
he has become a leading scholar and she took him on pilgrimage and brought him to Mecca and left him there. And then the rest is history, you know. We don't do not, not say, we do not need to say more about Imam al-Bukhari. And coming back home uh, here, you know, the grandmother of, uh, uh, of Sheikh Uthman ibn Fawjiyo, Ruqayya. She is an amazing scholar, believed to be one of the early scholars that have written in the Arabic language in West Africa. And you could see the chronology, you know, she was from the side of his mother. And look at the kind of, you know, uh, grandchildren that he has produced, Uthman ibn Fawdiyo. And ibn, Uthman ibn Fawdiyo, you know, uh, produced Muhammad Bello, Asma, Atik, and all of them. This tells you that, you know, one of the things that I would like to argue here before I conclude this lecture is that the contribution of these men and women that we have had, you know, the Sokot Khalifid in particular, and some of the scholars that I gave you examples with today, is an example of success of parenting because the mothers and the fathers have never neglected their responsibility. And that was why they were able to produce men of high quality. Um, so uh, I can see that my time is approaching. So I will move uh, directly into the lessons that we can learn. There are at least 10 lessons that I, I would like to summarize from the stories that we have had today. One of the lessons is that there is consistency among leading scholars. Sheikh Uthman ibn Fodio, you know, Imam Malik ibn Anas, you know, uh, Alauddin al-Samraqandi, about providing quality education to women. So you can imagine that these scholars have produced, uh, you know, such, you know, leading, you know, uh, leading women that, uh, that, that the parents are so jealous to ensure that the people actually who marry them must be of the same caliber of knowledge as this, even if they are poor. Lesson number two, as we have seen, Sheikh Uthman ibn Fodio gave birth to Nana Asma bin Fodio, but who was her husband? Jidadu, his able student. Alauddin al-Samraqandi, Saeed ibn al-Musayyib, all of them who were the husbands of their daughters, they were their students. What is the lesson here? The lesson here is that the parents take active interest in who is going to be their son-in-law. Now we need to look at this and think critically in our society and especially considering what is happening now in around our communities to understand that are we playing this role? Do you just leave your daughter just like that? By the time she reaches the age of marriage, all you are after is anybody who knocks at the door. As long as he takes her away, you are happy? No. A successful parent takes active interest. He's not going to impose uh, the, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, the, the husband on the daughter, but he is there as an advisor and taking active interest in who becomes his father-in-law, uh, his son-in-law. Because at the end of the day, that kind of marriage is the one that would produce the type of ummah that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa will be proud of. That is the type of marriage that will produce children that will not be roaming on the street, begging, you know. That is the type of marriage that will produce the kind of children that will not attract, you know, wrath on us. Rather, they will attract, you know, um, blessing for us. Lesson number three. We have seen that mothers such as those of Imam Malik ibn Anas and Imam al-Bukhari taking a lead in producing men in the society. That is another thing. That, you know, and it's very interesting. It looks like, you know, a swap of the role. Women have an important role to play in producing the men that we have today. And we could see that these women, these women are taking active role in understanding and trying to, uh, you know, support their male children so that they become the pride of the society. Another lesson that parents need to understand, and especially in our own parts of the world, you could see that in the, in, in the case of uh, Asma bin Tifodio, for instance, she was an advisor to the caliph. At a point even, you could say that a lot of the thinking around in the caliphate was, was coming from her. So listening to our children, especially the women children, don't just leave them, you know, because you are a father and not engage them. We have heard that Qadi uh, Iyab, you know, he leaves his house, whatever he's doing, Asr prayer, lead the Asr prayer, he will enter his house and he will go and dedicate the rest of the evening teaching his daughters and the daughters of his brother. So dedicate your time, you know, talk to them, listen to them, let them advise you, you know, you know, because, you know, you, you could not see everything. 
This is what we have had. And we have seen this in the seerah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba about the role that women have played in their lives. Another lesson also is that persistence in making dua is very important if you have children. You know, this is how these scholars, and you could see with the mother of Imam al-Bukhari, persistence in dua. A boy that was born blind ended up, being see, ended up seeing, and today we are talking about him. Many years after he has left, and we cannot, the Muslim world cannot be independent, cannot be sufficient of the knowledge of people like Imam al-Bukhari. Another lesson, and I think this is very important, especially in this century. If we look at the story of Asma bin Tifudu, how many languages does she speak? She speaks four different languages. Arabic, Hausa, Fulfulde, and Tamashek. And she writes in them. And you could see that this has been documented. So the power of language is very important if you want to produce successful children. And especially in this, uh, in, in this generation. I was reading a book, uh, you know, and in fact, uh, when uh, Dr. Aliu, the chairman of this occasion, visited us some, uh, I think, two, three years back, he was a witness to the book review that I have done. You know, the book is called Industries of the Future. And in that book, you know, it's a recent study in 2016, I think it was written by one Alec Rose. And uh, he was evaluating, okay, how is the world going to look like in the next 50 years? And his conclusion was that a lot of things are going to change. Transdisciplinarity will, go in, will be one of the watch words. You don't have, you know, people cannot be experts in just one area. They can be experts in different fields, you know. Number two, knowledge of mathematics will be very important and history. But most importantly, he said the most important job of this century is language and parenting. You have to produce children who can speak many languages. This will open doors of opportunities for them. And today, and we are seeing it globally today. A job will be advertised. You want your son, you know, to get it. You want to apply. You are going, and then they will say, you know, English language mandatory, knowledge of Arabic and French essential. Or Arabic language mandatory, knowledge of German and whatever language is mandatory. Because language is very important. So as a parent, you want your children to be successful. You want to be to you want to be you want them to be pride of the Ummah. So even right now, do not just pay attention to teach them only the English language. No, teach them the Arabic language. You know, you are native language. Equip them and children have the capacity to take it. This is a very important lesson that we should learn, you know, from what we have seen from the life of Nana Asma, you know, being for you. Another lesson from the life of Nana Asma, actually she started teaching. She became a teacher at the age of 14. So encourage your children to become teachers as they are learning. And they, they, when I say they become teachers, it doesn't mean by going, you know, to start teaching in a school. No, at least by even teaching their siblings. Among the students of Nana as well, being told you where you know her brother Isa, Isa Kwari, and his friends, you know, they were taking knowledge from her, you know. So that will contribute in shaping the behavior of your child because like, right from young age, he will begin to uh, to earn the respect of the society, and the society will begin to have respect for him as well, and that will contribute, inshallah, in putting you in the right way because he knows that. His mistakes could affect others because he is already seen as a nobility. So parents, you know, you, you know, you, you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the blessing. Your children are attending a very good school. And there is a, a school in your community that doesn't have enough teachers. And you have a child who has graduated. Let him go and do voluntary teaching. Let him create, you know, uh, extra lessons for, people, for, for the children of the poor who cannot afford it. You know, let them become teachers. It's one of the way of the tarbiyah, you know, of establishing a successful uh, family. The next lesson is what I would like to call strong fathers, strong daughters. And actually, this is not my own word. It is the title of a book. Uh, you know, uh, my friend Muhammad Ahmed Bella actually drew my attention to this book in California about five years ago. And, uh, you know, it's a book that talks about the psychology of daughters and the importance and the role that, you know, fathers play in the life of their daughters. And I think this is an area that we really need to pay attention to, everyone, myself, and everybody who is listening to, to this. And in this book of psychology, you know, what, one of the things that I, I, I benefited from was that actually girls see their fathers as the first role models in their lives. And if I were to relate it, you could see Uthman ibn Fodio, a very strong father. Asma binti Abu Bakr, a very strong daughter. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, a very strong father. 
His daughter, a very strong scholar. You know, Fatima Samra Kandi, you know, Aisha Binti Abdul Hadi, you know, the, the, some of the women that I have not even had a chance to, 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 to mention, who was a great uh, scholar of, uh, of hadith. Um, he reported to even be one of the teachers of Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. You know, so strong fathers, strong daughters, you know, try as much as possible to be the role model and shape and, you know, have the personality. Think of it. Do I like my daughter to emulate me? Am I qualified? And in that book, what, one of the things I found interesting was that they said there is every tendency because a father is the window to the life of his daughter that when she comes to get married, there is every likelihood she will bring somebody like you. So if you don't provide the the right example, like uh, Saeed ibn al-Musayyib, how do you expect your daughter to bring the right, pass, the, the right person into your, into your family? So this is a very important lesson that we, need, we should think of. Another lesson is engaging in writing and scholarship. This is what we have seen in the life of Asma bin, for, bin Fodio. You could still link it to the family because uh, Sheikh Uthman ibn, ibn Fodio was a writer, was a scholar. Uh, his brother, Abdullah ibn Fodio, was a writer, was a scholar. You know, her brother, Muhammad Bello, was a writer, was a scholar. And in, you know, what, this is one of the things I enjoyed in the Tobogaji's thesis, where he tried to, tried to bring out this truth about the Sokoto Caliphate, that it was not only a revivalist movement, no, it was also a scholarly movement. And their daughters inherited that. And we have had some of the names that I had mentioned earlier, like Khadija al Kubra who was also uh, the daughter of Uthman, uh, you know, uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn Fodio. So writing, encourage your children to engage in writing. It's a way of de developing their thinking faculty and becoming the, the people that, inshallah, we will be proud of. The lesson number 10 is leadership and engagement in da'wah. If you look at Asma Ibn Fodio, what did she do? One of the things she did was to establish the entire movement which is and, and teaching women how to be leaders and not only be leaders, also how to engage in da'wah activities. I would like to quickly conclude this lecture with uh, some recommendations, I think, for the future. And I do hope that this recommendation could be useful to me and to all the people that are listening to this lecture. I think it would be good to convene a conference on women Islamic scholars in the Sokoto Caliphate. I think this is an area that we need to investigate as a way of showing the beauty of our society and the kind of women scholars that we have produced as a way of, you know, um, supporting, you know, the Muslim women, especially today to provide, to show them that, look, the women that we have in the Islamic society in Nigeria are not women who only specialize in watching in Hollywood and, uh, and Kanye Wood and Indian movies. No, they are scholars. We need to look at history and go back right from the generation of Ruqayya, the grandmother, or even before that, up to present day. Number two, I would like to recommend that I think it's worthy, of course, to introduce courses on women Islamic scholars, you know, in our universities, especially the universities, you know, the universities like Bayeru, uh, Uthman and Fudu, ABU, University of Ibadan, University of Lagos. Let us look at this, you know, introduce courses as a way of providing leadership and guidance, especially to the women folks. You know, uh, there is no reason why we should not do this in sociology department, in history department, in Islamic studies department. One of the amazing works that I came across while, while preparing this lecture is a book called Alamun Nisa. It's a book actually that compiles, you know, the story of women scholars, you know, and activists in the history of Islam from the beginning up to almost the 1950s. It was written by uh, a scholar called Umar Rida Kahala. And in that book alone, he has almost close to 4,000 women. Almost every woman that you think you know in, in, at the beginning of Islamic history, from the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, up to his generation, they were there. And he organized the book in such a beautiful manner. You know, he, 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 he organized the book actually uh, alphabetically. So you go through the book from, uh, from Hamza up to Ya. You can go and find, you know, and it is uh, quite interesting. Even I was interested to see if Nana Asma was mentioned there. I didn't find her, but I at least it gave a clue because most of the research focused on mainly in the Arab world, uh, you know, and, and other parts of Asia. But at least you'll find that in, in, in that you'll find several Asmas, you'll find several Aisha, several Fatimas. Even if you are looking for a way to select a, a name for your, for, your, for your daughter, that book is a compendium. And it's a compendium of research, which I, build, I believe should be in the bookshelf of any scholar who is interested in studying the contribution of women uh, scholars. 
Um, the next uh, recommendation that I would like to give is it will be good to establish an endowment, a kind of workup that will produce an elect uh, electronic archives on the writings history and the scholarship of the Socrates Caliphate with a dedicated section uh, on, the, uh, on, on women scholars. This is very important because we are now in the digital age. Uh, digital age. People are hungry for these materials. Uh, the next recommendation also is to encourage postgraduate students at master's and PhD levels to conduct research on women Islamic scholars in Sokoto Caliphate from, uh, you know, from the jihad to the present. You know, this is another opportunity. I would also like to strongly recommend, especially for our universities uh, in West Africa, to look at the possibility of establishing endowed chairs. For instance, Nana Asma'u Professorial Chair of Women's Scholarship in Africa. You know, the university can put the endowment or can look at some of our philanthropists and say, look, there is an important work here. Would you mind investing some resources to, uh, to have a chair on, 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 on a research about Nana Asma'u? And that chair would be a person who would lead in producing materials that could become part of the syllabus and the curriculum in our universities. And looking at the challenges that we are seeing in our society today, I would like to see that uh, or suggest that even at the political level, the, legislat the legislatures, especially in the Muslim uh, majority states, and even the, uh, the, the, the National Assembly, to, co to initiate a bill that we call the Nana Asma'u Bill on women empowerment and the dignity of the girl child. It's, it's better, we have the history. We don't have to always think that we have to copy the child rights act or whatever. We have our own history that we can use to address some of the challenges that we have. The children that are roaming on the street, you know, the women girls that are doing what is called tala, hawking, you know, taking and, uh, you know, and being abused in the process. We are reading all the horrible stories every day. You know, this kind of bill can become part of the hustle and governance and that way even some of the leaders could be held to account that, okay, all we want you to do is if you get elected as a legislature, pass this and use your power to make sure that the uh, people in the executive, you know, provide enough resources at the local level to ensure that our daughters are fully educated, are fully empowered. My brothers and my sisters, my teachers listening to this uh, presentation, I would like to conclude this uh, discussion by saying that uh, I would like to conclude this discussion by saying that, you know, one of the ways in which um, we can address some of the challenges that our society is facing is by producing what I would like to call a strong woman. The Muslim society, the Muslim world, our own part of the world should not be afraid of having women as scholars. The better we produce women in our homes who are scholars, who are well-trained, the better for us. The more we neglect this responsibility, the more we will continue to cry for help. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Whatever I said that is correct is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever I said that is incorrect is a mistake from me. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me and uh, draw my attention to the mistake. I thank each and every one of you for creating the time to listen to this lecture. And I would like to hand over and go back to the chairman, Dr. Ali Ibrahim. Thank you very much. Dr. Ali, can you hear? It seems like uh, it's frozen. Brother Nabil, are you over there? Are you there? Assalamu alaikum. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. We thank Allah, the Almighty for giving us the opportunity to listen to this amazing lecture by our line of scholar, Dr. Muhammad Jamil uh, Yusha'u. Uh, I, think, I think at the beginning I stated that uh, we will, inshallah, through the lecture, we will learn uh, the, the capacity of our scholar, uh, very learned, very vast in so many areas. And uh, I think even I didn't do justice to him in the introduction. But I, I leave it to the participant to, you know, judge, uh, alhamdulillah, the type of person we have. Uh, we thank you very much, Dr. Muhammad Jamil, for this lecture. Jazakumullahu khair.
uh, summarizing this lecture is really uh, because he made it very, very clear to all of us. From the beginning, he mentioned what he wanted to achieve, uh, the, 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 the areas he wanted to cover, and he has done justice to, to this lecture. Uh, he talked about the, the Nana Asma, not only as a person, but as a tradition. So, and not only that, this tradition is a tradition that she has, she has carried uh, forward. She was not the beginning of this tradition, and uh, he continued showing the successful women in Islamic history and uh, how these women uh, we are being, you know, uh, produced with the support of women uh, again, but in the support of women and their parents, their parents, um, uh, fathers, uh, never neg neglected them. They pay attention to their development, their capacity, intellectual development, uh, particularly in the context of Nana Asma'u uh, and many other examples he has shown. He has uh, really uh, presented a very good. In fact, the, the, the tradition, the, the unique uh, feature of Nana Asma, the entire movement, which has um, become a, 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 a norm in many areas of the world, in the United States, in the UK, and the recent example he has given uh, also has shown that uh, the Nana Asma is a tradition which, is, which continues, and we need to uh, elaborate and expand this movement to show the role of women in Islamic history, what she has done to the Muslim Ummah, the 21st century uh, parenting especially need to learn a lot in terms of uh, applying the lesson. Not only that, Dr. Jamil has continued to tell us about the lessons, uh, 10 good lessons that each one uh, is something that we can consider as a check home for each and all of us as the participants in this uh, webinar. And uh, he has given us some recommendations, uh, especially the issue of uh, conference, the need to come up with a conference which will discuss the role of Islam uh, women uh, in the Sokoto Caliphate, the need for endowment, the need for more studies, for PG studies, and the other, uh, the, the Nana Asma bill, a, a kind of initiative, which I think the credit will go to that. I never thought of that. And I think it's a beautiful recommendation, which I believe the organizers will carry this message forward, inshallah, and together we can achieve, we can have something even Allah implemented. So at this juncture, uh, I will open to the participants for questions and comments to this uh, beautiful presentation. I have seen many commendations from the participants. Not only that, we need to also hear some maybe uh, questions uh, so that uh, Dr. Jamilu could clarify further and we can learn a bit, alhamdulillah. Doctor, uh, let me open it to the participants. Of course, we have our elders. Uh, let me start uh, with the Professor Salis Shehu. Really, I would like to, if you can chip in at this very beginning, uh, uh, it will be very good and wonderful. Uh, then we can continue with other uh, question and answers. Uh, Dr. Nabil, is prop with us. Dr. Nabil. Dr. Nabil, now, now, Professor Salih Sushehu. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. So, uh, may I this medium, uh, use this medium to say salam to all the participants? But uh, foremostly, and uh, very importantly, to the presenter, our brother, Dr. Muhammad Jamil Yushaw. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, if you follow the commentary line, if you follow the commentary line, mm -hmm. you will see how people have been commending the lecture, that is an evidence of the excellence of the lecture. Uh, we did not uh, expect anything less than uh, what we got 
from Dr. Jamil Yushao. I know he's busy schedule, but once I sent the request to him about this lecture, he did not hesitate to accept. He accepted it wholeheartedly and at once. So that was very encouraging. And Alhamdulillah, we have uh, gained uh, a lot from the presentation. Thank you so much. I saw uh, Brother Amir Abdullah Hilami also comment when he was uh, when he wrote that uh, the recommendations made by Dr. Jamil Yusha are very very important recommendations that the organizers should take note of them very seriously. I would want to assure Malam Abakar Lamito and all others, including the presenter, <coughs> that inshallah we'll take note of these uh, recommendations and see how to build upon them. They are very, very important. Finally, uh, two quick points. Number one, uh, from the presentation made by Dr. Jamil Yusha'u, we can see clearly uh, evidences of the, the point that was made or the message of the Arabic poet, the Egyptian Arabic poet, Ahmad Shawki, in his very popular poet, which some people used to to, to, to cite as hadith, but that is not a hadith. The, the poem that begins with Al Ummu Madrasatun Ida Adattaha Adatta Shaaban Tayyib al Araki. This meaning a woman is like a, a school when you train her. It's like you are train, uh, training an entire generation. I think from all the things that have been said, we can see clear evidence of this. The impact of women's scholarship is tremendous. The impact of women education is quite far reaching. So I think uh, we should take this very seriously. In fact, Ahmad Shauki, somewhere in the poem that I'm referring to, he said, Fi duri hunna, shu'un hunna kathiratun, ka shu'udi rabbi saifi wal mirzaki. That the role that women play in their houses in terms of bringing up children and teaching them is as important as the role played by a jihadist who bears sword and spear fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That their role in teaching children and bringing them up, especially when these women are educated, is no less important than a person that has gone to fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think this is very evident from the presentation that was made on Nana Asamau and all the points that were made on other women scholars. My final point, there is a trend that has, be, uh, that is, uh, that has been going on here in Northern Nigeria, which I don't know whether we have uh, paid serious attention to it. I don't think we have. And uh, we need to pay serious attention to it and to try to see how to leverage on that in order to promote serious, purposeful, and impactful women's scholarship. That is the fact that there is a growing trend of having many women, women memorizers of the Quran. 
last year here in Kano, and I wrote it on Facebook, here in Kano, Sheikh Goni Yehuza Goni Danzarga, you know, christened or conferred the title of Goni on about 100 people. And out of these 100 people, there were, I think, about 16 women who were conferred with the title of Gwani, that is Gwanar Qur'ani. This is a tremendous progress in women's scholarship. We need to leverage on that. And then if you are invited to many Tahafis school for speech and prize giving day, you will see that in most of the schools that I used to be invited, you would see that there would always be more female graduates who memorize the Quran. In fact, there was a school as I was invited in Bochi State where 16 people were to graduate as memorizers of the Quran. Out of the 16, 15 were girls. It was only one boy that was among the graduates. There was another incident that I was, I was also invited here in Kano. And the number of women, girls, who were graduating as memorizers of the Quran was almost double of the number of boys. What are we doing? Have we paid serious attention to this? These girls that are memorizing the Quran, have we been following up? on the, the future of their education, what they're doing, how do we organize their education to ensure that they get better educated so that they can be more useful to the society. And I think uh, we're not paying much attention to this. This would have been a very good answer, especially to feminists and other propagandists that always find pleasure in accusing us and criticizing us and also criminalizing us that we're not doing much about the education of women. This is a trend that has been going on and I think there has not been change in this trend. So these are the few things that I would want to say. Uh, thank you so much once again, Dr. Jamilu uh, and all the rest. I should also thank uh, Dr. Ali Nahir for effectively chairing this session. And as usual, Dr. Nabil and Mala Mustafa Awolu have been open doing in ensuring that these Zoom meetings and lectures do not fail. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor, for the wisdom and the advices. Now, uh, I have seen some hands. Uh, you see, from all the comments I have been following, like what the Prof has said, you can see commendation emails for sending the presentation. This tells you a lot that people are, I mean, got this lecture very clearly. Alhamdulillah. Yet, notwithstanding, we still open it. I can see Amir Lamido, Mala Abdullahi, please, uh, Malam Nabil, uh, allow Malam Abdullahi Lamido to make his comment, please, or question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to thank uh, our brother, our friend, uh, Dr. Muhammad Jamil Yushau for this very, very interesting, very, very uh, educative lecture. Uh, Alhamdulillah, as stated by Professor Salif Kiyuhu and Dr. Aliu, uh, uh, we, as we can expect even more from our brother. Those of us who were with him at Bayro University can know how resourceful he has always been. May Allah uh, bless him with more knowledge and more wisdom, inshallah. Uh, I want to emphasize some of the points he made quickly, inshallah, and especially that aspect of uh, women writers. You see, writing is one of the most important aspects of scholarship that we have neglected in our society. 
and uh, given their own the nature of their responsibilities and their schedules women should be in the forefront of this project of writing in our society but the point is you can't write if you don't read therefore we need to really have a project a program of uh, creating i mean producing women readers and women scholars and women writers i think this should be one of the projects that the triple it that uh, islamic forum of nigeria and especially the center for gender studies should take with all seriousness uh, inshallah I would want to recommend, uh, in line with what our brother Muhammad Jamil has said, the need for a, a project of writing small books, or at least one small book about Nana Asma'u, the story of Nana Asma'u, Asma'u in Hausa first, and, and then be translated probably into other local languages, including Full Full Day. That will be so friendly to the young, uh, you know, uh, students in the primary and secondary schools which they can read in themselves. I think, of course, there are a lot of writings that have might have done have been done by Jim Boyds and others, but I think we need something that uh, would be very interesting and friendly to the young the younger ones in our society. Uh, second to the last thing I will mention or I will want to emphasize is what Professor Salih Shehu has said. I have discussed this with many of our friends. Around 1993-94, I remember 95-96, when we were participating in the Quranic recitation competition. I remember some of our mates among the ladies, some of them we, ag we agreed that they were better than we are in terms of their proficiency in recitation of the Quran and memorization. In 1996, I have seen Dr. Awal Tilde. I, people like um, Dr. Mansur Isayulwa and Dr. Awal Tilde and others were in Bajoga when we attended the uh, Quranic recitation competition, Bauchi State. Many of them recited the Quran excellently. But I have always asked myself, where are these? You don't know where they are. You people benefit from uh, Dr. Mansur Israel, who has become a scholar in his own right. And many of them, or many of our friends whom, together with uh, whom we did this recitation, have become scholars, men among them. But the ladies, you don't know of their own story. I think something needs to be done in this direction so that, you know, in al Muslimin or Muslimati or Mu'minin or Mu'minat, we should not, as a society, agree to you know, underutilize the capacity of 50% of our population. At least women constitute 50% of our population. And I don't think a society will progress if it, if it makes about 50% of its population to be only dependent, to be unproductive, and less utilized in terms of their own capacity. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wassalam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Uh, before I give chance to Dr. Neville, let me ask if there is anyone that wants to ask questions or comments so that uh, uh, Dr. could combine uh, on the, these uh, issues. If not, then uh, that means people uh, will, you know, understood the lecture very well, like I mentioned. Uh, and uh, uh, I have my own comment before anyone said uh, regarding the maybe uh, one of the things as far as uh, especially in the north, uh, people are trying to look at the, how to balance between the uh, marriage life and the work or education, women education. This part, if we can carefully and uh, I don't know very, if we can address it well, inshallah, I think it will be a turning point for the way we perceive uh, women and the role we give to them and the contribution they will make or they are making could be increased, inshallah. Also, I think uh, I can see Professor Muhammad. Uh, please allow Professor Muhammad uh, to make his comment or question before Dr. Jamil take over. Now, Dr. Muhammad Rabiu, 
Alhamdulillah, uh, well done for the presentation by Brother Dr. Jamil. Uh, it is a very amazing presentation. And one or two comments that I wanted to add in his, on his presentation is that uh, the movement of Ta Entaru uh, originated not uh, from Nana Asama'u Rahimahallah, but it was started earlier from her elder sister, which is uh, uh, Nana Khadija, the, one of the daughters of Sheikh Usman Damfodio, and she has started that movement by training women in education and training them in taking affairs of some uh, social activities and charitable activities as well. Even she teaches them uh, first aid, first aid rudiment. As we know, we have our traditional nurses. So Nana Khadija started that. Then after Nana Khadija, Nana Asama'u Wargari uh, continues with that and it was developed in her time. Uh, another correction that I wanted to make is that uh, as if I had, not necessarily, maybe I didn't hear it correct, correctly, that he said, Nan Asma'u uh, write commentary on Holy Quran. Uh, what Nan Asma'u did on Quran is she write uh, and she wrote full, full day poems which uh, contain the whole surah, chapters of Holy Quran, so that she can simplify memorizing them to her students, both in entire movement and those who are usually coming to her home from neighboring uh, houses. Uh, this is some correction that I wanted to make. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, help the triple IT and the organizers of this uh, 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 webinar to more to choose more suitable and uh, important topics and discuss them. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wassalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So thank you very much, Professor, for the comments. I'm sure the doctor will respond to them. Uh, I have seen Muhammad uh, Mohajir was raising his hand. So if uh, maybe Dr. Nabil, if you can allow him so that we can combine uh, these uh, comments and questions to pass it to the floor. Now, Muhammad Mohajir. Muhammad Mohajir had been unmuted. You can take on. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah. I want to really appreciate um, the presentation by our great scholar. May Allah continue to enrich him, you know, immensely in knowledge. Uh, it is a wonderful presentation. I just have um, um, just um, little, little word to, as a comment. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hello? Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. We, 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 we can hear you, good, please. Good. Um, yeah, Alhamdul, Alhamdulillah. Yeah, my, my, my comment here is, um, you know, I, as many times if I listen to good presentation like this, very rich presentation, you know, I, I'll be troubled in my heart. Uh, as if um, we, we have this treasure and then our, our, our strategy of um, trying to implement them on our today women really, really need to be highly reviewed. Um, I have the life from what Lamido said, um, converting things like this, this kind of legacy to languages and making them available for our women to also study. Um, trying to review our, 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 our strategy is very, very important. The time for us to walk our talk. Because respected brothers here, what happened today in various homes or the cases we see at hand 
uh, is something else, uh, especially even, even not just from the non-Muslim home, but we are talking of real our homes. Uh, is a very serious problem. If we could have all this legacy, uh, not just for presentation, we should think, and also, if possible, uh, this, this good forum should also form a committee. What can we do to help the Muslim Ummah today? Because when, when the society fails, then the, the women has failed. So education of women is very key, that we know. I think we need to revive this very good culture. My own is not just we have listened to the presentation. What can we do as a key factor to work this good presentation to revive uh, our women today? And of course, our men today also need to be talked to. We pray that Allah make our prayers easy for us. Um, salam uh, Dr. Dr. Jami, thank you very much, uh, Muhammad, for the beautiful comment. Uh, and sorry, pardon me, before I hand over, still, you know, looking at the participants, uh, we have more male uh, than female in the group. <laughs> and I think this is also a challenge, and that tells us uh, how we are doing our things. I have seen Professor Aisha Abdul raising her hand, so please allow her to make Comment because that means she's the first woman uh, on this uh, important topic uh, to talk. Please, Prof, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Aminu alaikum wa salam, Prof. Uh, I am very pleased that. Uh, Madam Jamilu is making this presentation. Actually, when the idea and we started work on it, I was in my mind, I said, and I have even started writing on Nana Asma'u, but as soon as I saw this, I said, it is even better that <laughs> I will not be the one to make that presentation, but somebody else and uh, my brother. Muhammad Jabir, and uh, of course he did justice to, pre to the presentation, even though network uh, prevented me from joining in the beginning. Uh, we really appreciate that, and uh, we will hold my, all, my other brothers also, Professor Salih Sishewa and Amir, for what we agreed that we are going to do. We'll continue the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, over to you. You can address the questions and the comments, inshallah, before we maybe close in for the day. Uh, uh, Alhamdulillah. Thank you sorry, uh, very much uh, for all the comments, inshallah, and the good wishes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I believe we are all uh, brothers in Islam and uh, looking forward to the same Natija, inshallah. Uh, let me uh, start with the with Professor Muhammad Rabi Usad. I couldn't thank you enough. And perhaps maybe some of the participants do not know Professor Rabi is uh, one of his areas of expertise. He is an authority on Sokoto Caliphate. He is also an authority on Nana Asma of Audio. And I can tell you categorically without his contribution, probably I wouldn't have been able to do this lecture the way I did it. Uh, he was gracious enough to send me his book that he has written in Arabic on uh, you know, Nana Asma'u. And uh, one of the things that I have always wanted to do was when writing about this kind of topic, to find original research that emerged from within. Uh, because a lot of the work on Nana Asma'u uh, is not a bad thing necessarily, it was written in English language, but uh, a number of the writers actually did not come from the same culture or background or locality as, uh, you know, uh, as many of us. So, his amazing work, it's a field work. And I do hope that Professor Muhammad Rabi Saad will find an opportunity actually to get that work translated into English. Hausa and even other languages, Yoruba, Igbo, and many of the languages. Because one of the things that I would like to draw attention to while um, having, you know, this message should not just stay with us, especially those of us that come from the northern part of the country. This is a global message and it resonates. So as much as we can, uh, you know, trying to disseminate it, translate it into many languages, it, it will be good. I appreciate his comment and the correction. Uh, I accept it and inshallah I'll go and, uh, you know, uh, revise my note. It's a very useful comment and actually new knowledge to me. This is the first time I'm knowing that actually Entaru was not started by Nana Asma herself, but by her sister Khadija Al-Kubra. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is really, really amazing. Uh, I would also like to thank, uh, I would say, my mother and also teacher, Professor Aisha Ismail. Thank you so much for being here. 
uh, it's an honor actually. I'm sure you are more qualified to do this kind of presentation and perhaps even uh, from a woman perspective. So uh, much appreciated and uh, you know, your contribution is quite key. Many people do not know uh, what people like you and our mothers have gone through. The Professor Aisha was one of the first set of women actually in Kano who were able to come out and seek Islamic education when it was a taboo in the town, yet they resisted. Many people do not know this. So thank you so much, uh, Prof, uh, and our teacher, and our neighbor, our mother. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, some of the, most of the things that were uh, stated were really, really comments, but I'm quite interested in what, in the point that was raised by uh, uh, Dr. Ali Dahiru, which is about combining marriage life and education. This is a very important point, um, but I think if you look at the life of Nana Asma Ufodio, there is an answer to that. Everything that she was doing, she combined it while she was a housewife. So what we need to understand is what was the strategy. Number two, one of the things that I would like to suggest uh, or to, to think about, about this issue of combining life, uh, education, and working mothers. I want to believe that we, the men in particular, Allah has placed the responsibility of leading the homes in our hands. We have a major responsibility to make it easy for the women to do that. So as much as we can, because it is a responsibility. So, um, uh, and, and if you look at it, while I was researching these topics, one of the things that I, I came across, actually, I was listening to a lot of lectures and reading, this kind of question came up. How were the Muslim women in those days, you know, able, you know, to provide the kind of leadership and scholarship that they were providing? And one of the answers I got was the support they got from the men. And especially the men who are well, who have, who have the well, who are well to do, who are enough, who have the capacity, you know, to provide enough in the house that the daily course, cooking and everything do not always take 90% of the attention of the wives. You know, you as a husband, you know, have a responsibility. I know it is a very challenging time, but we need to organize this, you know, and you have to make it a responsibility. Number two, as a husband, as a father, you have to make it a priority, the education of your wife, the education of your daughters, has to be as equal as that of the boys. And that means you also stepping in and providing support. You know, um, you, you suppose you do, for instance, you don't have the opportunity to, um, to provide a maid that will support your wife. But think of it, they're very simple, and I'm sure all of us can understand this language. How many hours do we spend in Majalisa talking to our friends? On a daily basis, each one of us count. How many hours do we spend in Majalisa People actually leave their job and go straight to Majalisa and stay there from 4 p.m. until 10, 11 p.m. What prevents you from going home? Or at least three to four of those hours. To be at home, if it means supporting your wife to look at the children so that she can have free time to go and focus on her education. It's a question of priority, prioritizing and strategy. And I think uh, from this perspective, uh, you know, the brothers, we have to really think critically about this and prioritize the education of women so that they could have free time. And once they have free time, believe me, you will not regret it because this is something that you would see on your children. You will see it on the larger society. I was, I, I was participating in one of the webinars, you know, that was organized by Triple IT, you know, which was delivered by Brother Lemu, you know. And I look at it, I, it was while I was preparing this lecture and I thought, subhanAllah, what a good example. Brother Lemu and his sister, they had a very strong and educated mother. And look at the children she produced. Think of this critically. Supporting the women to have quality education, to have a life work balance if they, have, if they are career women so that they can have free time to enhance their education, you will end up seeing it be reflected in your children. So these are some of the comments that I will, uh, uh, I will make and I would like to take that on board. Um, and I'm very, very grateful to all those who supported me in uh, preparing for this lecture. I, uh, as I said, Professor Muhammad Rabi Isaac's work was very, was very, very important. I would like to also thank specifically my father, who has also taken keen interest on the lecture and he support, supplied me with some of the materials and advice that I got, uh, that I put, uh, you know, uh, in this lecture. It was uh, very, very useful to me. Uh, and also to our teacher, Professor Salus Shehu, and all my teachers that I am seeing, uh, Dr. Edi Dukan, and many uh, that I cannot uh, probably, perhaps maybe they connected with a different device. I'm actually very, very grateful, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
make this uh, very useful and beneficial to all of us. My brother, Dr. Nabil, it was great reconnecting with you, inshallah. And with this, I say, subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Thank you very much once again, Dr. Muhammad Jamil, for the responses. Uh, before I hand over to, uh, I have I learned, uh, Professor is uh, maybe it's not is away. Oh, Professor, okay. Dr. Dukawa, please, you want to make any comment? Because that's on the agenda, Prof will give you a word of thanks. If Prof Dukawa want to make a comment, I want to give him this uh, honor now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to join others in commending the presenter, may Allah reward him abundantly. And I want to quickly request two short requests to the participants on this meeting. Um, I'm sure. We are all convinced that uh, we are more informed now than before we join the meeting. Uh, and um, we shall not relent in joining uh, the next um, edition of the series. Uh, so uh, two quick or short requests are that, uh, number one, uh, each and every one of us, when the organizers uh, serve us with the text of the lecture, we should try and share it with as uh, many of our contacts as possible. And uh, number two, when next we are coming, I will add that uh, each and every one of us invites one, uh, no, a minimum of two more people uh, to win the meeting. The information, the more information that Kalibet is mentioned, something fear, uh, it is something that you. Uh, rather than mention the great Muslim uh, of the good artist, things of, uh, of knowledge, he or she of uh, a tradition of uh, being protected, be useful to us, uh, a situation of funds. Um, okay, the network is. Uh really not uh, good okay doctor the same we lost doctor at the, in the network okay I, alhamdulillah i think we got the message inshallah we try to invite more participants and they share across when there is such a important lecture that concern all of us and uh, other comments uh, Okay, doctor, you still want, you want to complete. Doctor, I can see doctor is back, please, because we don't want to miss this uh, message. We want to get it full. No, Alhamdulillah, I think I have put the message out for us. Jazakumullah. Okay, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much for all the comments and the questions. Uh, now, uh, at this juncture, I would like to invite Professor Salih Sushehu to give us uh, the vote of thanks, uh, especially to the speaker and the participant uh, before we close the closing prayer. He can close the prayer, please. Professor, over to you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I think uh, I did uh, the, the vote of thanks earlier in my comment. <laughs> I actually thank and pray for the presenter and you, mm. the moderator. I thank uh, Brother Nabil, Dr. Nabil, and Brother Mustafa Awalu. I thank uh, 
the participants uh, who have uh, been very promising. I can see there are names that are always with us. I don't have to keep on mentioning them, but I can see some of them have even made comments. Mm. So for mm. all, and uh, some of the directors of the triple IT that are with us, like Dr. Dukawa, like uh, Imam Said from Ghana, who is our coordinator in Ghana, and so on and so forth. To all, I say Jazakumullah Khairan. We have uh, kept people for nearly two hours now. We need to release them. So subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-akhirati hasanatan. Wa kena azab al-nar. Rabbana la tuzik ulubana ba'da idh hadaytana. Wa hablana min ladunka rahmatan innaka anta wahab. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa thuriyatina kurrata a'ayunin wajalna lilmuttaqina imama. Allahumma yassir lana umurana wa stur awratina. وآمن روعاتنا وحفظنا بما تحفظ به إبادك الصالحين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يتسكن وسلام على المسلمين والحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you God that's the end, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. So, thank you, Dr. Thank you.